Hi, I am Prabhanjan and I'm going to talk about quantum zero knowledge in the concurrent composition setting. This is in joint work with Kai Men Chung and Rolando La Placa. Zero knowledge is a notion that we are all familiar with. The traditional notion of zero knowledge stipulates that the conversation between a prover and a verifier can be simulated. In other words, uh, the verifier doesn't learn any additional information uh, after talking to the prover. You know, in most protocols we have seen so far, the assumption is that the verifier is a classical PPT algorithm. However, this assumption has been challenged uh, by the prospect of quantum computers. In the last few years, uh, some companies and many governments have intensified efforts towards building quantum computers. In the next few decades, we need to brace ourselves towards the possibility that quantum computers could become a reality. And towards this, we need to start thinking about designing protocols that are secure even after quantum computers come into existence. So we're going to look at one such uh, protocol, which is, you know, we're going to look at one such notion, which is the notion of quantum zero knowledge. So this notion is, a, an, is an analog of uh, zero knowledge in the quantum setting. And it roughly says that the conversation between a prover and a quantum verifier um, can be simulated by a quantum simulator. This notion is not new. I mean, people have actually looked at um, uh, quantum zero knowledge protocols, but they're mostly focused on standalone uh, quantum zero knowledge protocols. In the setting, we assume that there is a prover and a, and a verifier um, and um, you know the execution between the prover and this verifier is run in isolation. So in other words, you know, if the prover is talking to this verifier, then it cannot talk to any other verifier uh, during this time. So the good news is that there are some feasibility results known. Um, so we do know how to achieve the standalone QZK. However, this is not a very realistic setting. Um, so if you think about it, it's not reasonable to assume that you know the prover only talks to one verifier at a time. Uh, in the real world setting, you know you have uh, you could have a you know um, maybe like a server who is running, um, who's taking the role of the prover, you know talking to many clients who are taking the role of verifiers uh, at the same time. So a more realistic setting that we can consider is uh, concurrency. So in this setting, we have um, a prover talking to multiple verifiers at the same time. And the, these verifiers can interleave their messages with the prover in any arbitrary fashion. Um, you know, maybe you know, there's one verifier who starts the execution with the prover, uh, and before this verifier sends its second message, maybe uh, another verifier starts talking to this prover. And we want the notion of uh, zero knowledge to even hold in this setting. You know, and the, the notion of uh, uh, QZK in the concurrent setting will be called as uh, concurrent QZK. And unfortunately, we don't know much about uh, the possibility or impossibility of uh, QZK in the concurrent composition setting. But if you look at the classical cryptography literature, there are many, many works on, uh, you know, on, on, uh, on the feasibility of uh, concurrent CK. So before we try to understand the uh, feasibility of QZK in the concurrent composition setting, let's first try to formally define what uh, concurrent QZK is. So in order to do that, we need to define um, what is a malicious, uh, how does a malicious verifier behave? So in this case, the malicious verifier is a QPT algorithm. Uh, let me denote this by V star. Uh, and we are going to work in the setting where the verifier can be non-uniform. Um, so in other words, it can take as input an auxiliary state. Um, this auxiliary state denoted here by rho uh, can be thought of as um, you know, uh, a quantum state that has a polynomial number of qubits. And this verifier V star can invoke Q sessions or Q verifiers with the prover P, with, with the honest prover P. 
um, and the sessions are denoted by V1 through VQ. Okay, so to be a little more precise about how the interaction between the prover and the verifier vstar goes, so we can think of uh, every message computed by vstar to be, let's say, unitary, uh, followed by a measurement where this measurement determines the message to be sent to the prover. Right. And then we can think of every message we start sends to be of the following format. Um, so it's message one corresponding to the first session, message two corresponding to the second session and so on. Uh, and then we have Q comma message Q where Q is the number of sessions. And then you can do this for all the messages. And, you know, not all sessions need to, you know, uh, be active in any round. Um, so, for example, the ith session can choose not to, you know, send any message to the prover uh, in some round. In this case, it will set the message, uh, message i, to be empty, which which we are going to interpret as saying that the ith verifier is not sending any message in this round. And we say that a protocol satisfies concurrent QCK if there exists a simulator such that the following two distributions are indistinguishable. Now, the output of the verifier, you know, after it interacts with the honest prover, uh, you know, the output of the verifier V star is going to be some state. We want this state to be uh, computationally indistinguishable, uh, or rather, like a distribution of states to be computationally indistinguishable from the, uh, the 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 distribution specified by the simulator. Right. Um, so the output of the simulator. Uh, describes a distribution and we want uh, this distribution to be indistinguishable from the output of the verifier. So it's the same uh, as, as uh, uh, classical ZK, except that, you know, the algorithms here uh, are quantum and, and also the advice is, uh, is quantum. There are two notions of concurrent QZK that we can consider. One is bounded concurrency and another one is unbounded concurrency. Right? So in, in, in bounded concurrency, the number of sessions Q needs to be fixed a priori, like even before the protocol begins. Uh, in the case of unbounded concurrency, you know, the verifier, the malicious verifier can choose how many sessions to run, um, you know, at the beginning of the security experiment. So it need not be specified as part of the protocol description. So we can also consider another weaker notion, which is parallel QCK. Um, so in, in the parallel setting, we want all the verifiers to send the messages at the same time. While this is not the most uh, useful notion in practice, uh, parallel ZK is still useful for constructing, let's say, MPC protocols. Okay, so let's, let me uh, give a, an overview of our results. So we, we initiate a formal study of concurrent QZK. Uh, we give a feasibility result of bounded concurrent QZK for uh, all languages in NP. And we actually show how to get uh, quantum proof, proof of knowledge for NP. Um, and finally, we also show feasibility of bounded concurrent QZK for uh, QMA. So QMA is a quantum analog of MA. Um, so, um, we say that a relation is QMA relation if, um, you know, for every instance, Boolean uh, string, let's say X, we say X comma some state belongs to this relation. Uh, if there's a quantum algorithm, quantum polynomial time algorithm that on input this instance and the state outputs uh, one with high probability. So, it's uh, in MA, the witness is uh, classical, in QMA, the witness can be quantum. So that's, that's the difference. Um, so I'm not going to elaborate on the quantum proof of knowledge and the bounded concurrent QZK for QMA results. Uh, I encourage you to look at the paper. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the feasibility of bounded concurrent QZK for NP. Okay, so um, let me zoom in on this and expand on this result statement. So we show that there exists bounded concurrent QZK for NP, uh, assuming uh, the existence of post-quantum one-way functions. And two nice features about our protocol is that, first of all, it's a, it's a public coin uh, protocol, and moreover, it's a proof system. That is, the 
soundness holds against uh, unbounded provers. So we know that uh, there, you know, there, there was a prior work on bounded parallel QCK argument system for NP from FHE for quantum computation, which is going to appear in Eurocrypt this year. So our work improves upon their result in terms of assumption. Also, we get the stronger, stronger notion of bounded concurrent QCK. Let's dive right into the techniques. A natural approach that we can consider is the following. So we can start with a classical bounded concurrent ZK for NP. So we do know how to achieve this. So let's start with the construction that we know. And then what we can do is, you know, try to come up with a, a different proof for the same construction that proves that this construction is actually secure against quantum verifiers and not just classical verifiers. So in order to do that, you know, we need to figure out a way to port the classical simulation strategy to quantum um, to quantum simulation, right? And we're going to focus on rewinding based simulation strategy. So, and towards this, you know, we can ask a more general question. Uh, what are the classical rewinding techniques that can be ported to the quantum setting? So we can identify a uh, quote unquote, uh, quantum friendly classical rewinding techniques. These are the techniques that uh, can actually be ported to the quantum setting. These are classical techniques, but that can be uh, adapted to the quantum setting. And a rule of thumb that we can adopt um, for identifying this class of quantum friendly uh, classical rewinding techniques is the following. So we can first ask if the classical rewinding technique is oblivious. What do I mean? Uh, you know, at, in any round, the simulator can, you know, decide whether it wants to rewind or not. And we want the property that the, you know, at any point in time, the simulators, the distribution on simulators decisions should be independent of the verifier state. And so it should be the same no matter what auxiliary state the verifier has. So this is the first condition. See, the other condition is that we want um, the simulator to be no recording. What does it mean? It means that uh, the simulator, you know, should not learn some information. Um, and then rewind and then you know continue to use the information that it had gathered from a previous rewinding for for future rewindings so this is the other sort of uh, guarantee we need so you might think that these two properties are sort of artificial and you can ask whether do we know any classical rewinding that satisfies these two properties and the answer is yes there are actually protocols that satisfy uh, both these there are actually techniques that satisfy both these properties so if you look at the um, the simulator of uh, the the popular graph isomorphism protocol, you can show that 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 particular simulator satisfies both these properties. You know there are other examples as well. So this is the um, this is sort of like the prototypical example that you can consider. Okay, so once we have identified this quantum friendly classical rewinding, the next step would be to combine this with uh, a lemma that was proposed by Watrous, and we can combine both of them to get quantum simulation. And so um, somehow we can, uh, you know, uh, merge these two different uh, techniques together to get a quantum simulator. So this is sort of roughly the strategy we are going to adopt to uh, come up with a feasibility result for bounded concurrent QZK. Okay. So towards this, we can ask if there are quantum friendly classical concurrent rewinding techniques, right? Um, and then we can try to combine them with waters. And the um, answer is unfortunately no. I mean, most of the techniques we know in the classical concurrent literature either violate the obliviousness condition or the no recording condition. Um, so which means that we need to really you know, sort of devise a new um, quantum friendly classical rewinding technique. And that's what we do in this work. So we propose a technique called block rewinding technique. And then we're going to use this technique to prove that the classical protocol of um, Bath, uh, Singh and Wickstrom uh, is bounded concurrent QZK. They showed the existence of classical concurrent ZK, uh, bounded concurrent ZK. And we're going to show that the same construction um, modulo some 
modifications in the parameters um, is also is secure in the quantum setting. Okay, so what is this block rewinding technique? Um, at a high level, what we do is we sort of divide the the entire transcript, which is the execution of the prover with all the verifiers, into blocks. And the simulator, what it's going to do is at the end of every block, it's going to do, decide whether to rewind to the beginning of the block or not with, with probability half. Right? And since the decision to rewind um, is oblivious of the very fast state, so the simulator will do this no matter what the auxiliary state was. So this particular um, step would satisfy the obliviousness condition. And when the simulator records, it's going to forget all the transcript it has remembered so far. So it, when it goes from step I to step J, uh, so sorry, when it when it rewinds from step J to step I, then it's going to forget all the messages from I to J. And thus, uh, the, the, this also satisfies the no recording condition. So this was a so really vague and high level um, idea of how the simulator would work. I mean, here there are many questions. How big are the blocks? You know, will the simulation work for all schedulings? You know, can the verifier somehow interleave the messages cleverly in, in such a way that the simulator fails? And uh, finally, what if the all the verifiers are bought in a single block? Um, will the simulator even rewind then, right? So um, if the simulator doesn't choose to rewind, then it would end up depending on the verified state and thus violating the obliviousness condition. So we need to also handle the case when all the verifiers are bought in a block, single block. Okay, so before uh, answering these questions, let's uh, look at the protocol description of Bas, uh, Singh, and Bigstrom. So their protocol is composed into two stages. In the first stage, uh, the prover P sends a commitment uh, of a bit to the verifier. And the verifier sends um, some other bit uh, to uh, back to P. So in terms of what commitment we use, we are going to use a statistically binding um, a quantum concealing commitment scheme, which can be based on post-quantum one-way functions. And in the second stage, uh, Brewer proves to the verifier that either it knows uh, the witness uh, for this instance, or uh, there are enough number of uh, executions in stage one where the verifier's bit agreed with the prover's committed bit. So we're going to use the term matching. Uh, so we say that, uh, you know, a particular execution of stage one has been matched if uh, the verifier's bit is the same as the prover's committed bit, right? In other words, if bi prime is the same as bi. And if we can, we can rephrase uh, this condition as saying that the number of matchings has to be at least uh, L over two plus uh, Q to the four uh, lambda. Right? So roughly, you know, uh, in expectation, L over two executions will have uh, the very fast bit to be the same as the prover bit. What we are asking is uh, something that is slightly more than uh, roughly half of the executions of stage one. Okay. So we're going to use the, you know, we're, we're going to call a single execution of stage one to be a slot. So let's first consider the setting when the simulator is, uh, uh, the, when the verifier is classical, and then, you know, we, we're going to see how to port the ideas developed here to the case when this verifier is uh, quantum. Okay. Okay. So we're going to divide the the transcript into B size blocks. We're going to fix uh, B soon. So what we're going to do is for the ith message of V star um, in in a block. What we are going to check is if uh, this message is a is the last message in a block. Okay. So if this message is the last message in the block, then you see how many of the sessions uh, contain a slot in this block B. Okay. So you're going to consider all the slots that are completely contained in this block, and then you're going to pick one of these slots uniformly at random, right? Um, so there are, let's say there are L verifiers whose uh, slots are contained in B, then you're going to pick one of the verifiers uniformly at random. Um, you know, the, of course, a single verifier could have multiple slots, just pick one of them at random. 
And then we're going to check if this slot has been matched. In other words, if bi prime is the same as bi. So if that is the case, then you move on to the next block. Otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to rewind. Uh, rewind to the beginning of the block. Okay. So let's first assume that um, somehow the verifier's interleaving strategy says that uh, one slot, you know, every block contains at least one slot. If this is the case, then you can see that the probability that the simulator rewinds uh, is going to be roughly half. Right? Um, so now you can ask, what if a block doesn't contain any slot? If a block doesn't contain any slot, then you know what you're going to do is the simulator is going to just you know pick a bit uniformly random. This is a dummy bit. And if this bit comes up as zero, then it goes to the next block. Otherwise, it's going to rewind to the beginning of the block. And why do we have this? Uh, remember, we need to satisfy a condition called obliviousness that says that the simulator's rewinding, uh, the, the, the decision to rewind should be independent of the verifier state, right? So this, you know, it could very well be the very, very well be the case that the verifier has uh, interleaved it, its messages in such a way that it, there does not exist any slot in a block. Uh, and if the simulator does not choose to rewind, then um, then its decision is depending on the very fast state, right? And that violates obliviousness. So we're going to add this condition as well in the description of the simulator. Okay, so now what if, uh, you know, the, the, the message that you're considering is the intermediate message in the block. In this case, you know, if it is a stage one message, then you're going to behave like the honest prover. You're going to just send a commitment of a random bit. If it is a stage two message, then you check if uh, the number of matchings uh, is at least L over two plus this additional Q to the four lambda or not. If it is less than that, then you're going to abort. Otherwise, you have sufficient number of matchings. Now you can use these matchings to complete the WI phase. So what is left is to show that the probability that the number of matchings uh, is at most L over two plus Q to the four lambda is uh, negligible, right? Because if this happens, then the simulator is failing. Right? And we want to show that the probability of this event is low. So the intuition is that for every verifier VI, the number of blocks that contain at least one slot of VI is at least six um, uh, times Q to the five lambda. So you can you can show this using a counting argument. Similarly, you can also show that the number of blo uh, blocks in which a particular verifier's slot is picked is also sufficiently high. Then you can use both combine both these facts to argue that with high probability using Chernoff bond. Um, at least three times q to the four lambda of these slots are matched. Um, you know, this is by the simulator um, employing the rewinding strategy. On the other hand, you know, there are still L minus three q to the four lambda slots remaining. And, you know, even, you know, even if the simulator doesn't try to match them, just by sheer luck, uh, half of them are going to be satisfied in expectation. And again, using Chernoff, you can show that the number of slots that are satisfied with high probabilities at least L over two minus two Q to the four lambda. So if you add both of them up, these two quantities up, you're going to get um, the desired bound, right? So you can argue that this is in fact negligible. Right, so that's how we complete the simulation strategy. So what is remaining is to show that uh, the verifier is, uh, in, in the, we need to show the case when the verifier is QPT and the quantum uh, simulation strategy is very simple. You know, the quantum simulator is just going to run the classical simulator and the verifier in superposition. So it's not going to measure anything, um, except at the end of the block. At the end of the block, it's going to measure something and based on that, it decides to rewind. Uh, and how does it rewind? It employs the rewinding strategy proposed by Watrous. So this is the rewinding that's going to be uh, given to us by the Watrous lemma. And we can show that a careful repeated application of Waters uh, lemma implies a successful simulation against a quantum uh, uh, verifier. Okay, so with this, uh, let me conclude this talk. Uh, we initiate a formal study of concurrent QZK. Uh, we showed a feasibility of bounded concurrent QZK for NP. A couple of results I didn't talk about is quantum proof of knowledge for NP. And we also show the feasibility of bounded concurrent QZK for QMA. 
So what is open is to show the possibility or impossibility of unbounded concurrent key of ZK um, and also post-quantum concurrent uh, secure computation. With this, uh, I conclude. Thanks.